We begin this morning with the House of Representatives, where some members have called on President Muhammadu Buhari to take responsibility for security lapses in the country. During a debate at plenary, the lawmakers highlighted the recent attack on the Abuja Kaduna airport by terrorists to make their point. Arise News reports. Days after terrorists attacked the Kaduna bound train, tempers are still high in Nigeria's House of Representatives. Federal lawmakers cannot hide their anger over the inability of the federal government to secure lives and properties across the country. Between 24 March 2022 to 28 March 2022, these armed bandits or harbor communities where they invaded. Over 117 people have been killed and some corpses are still yet to be recovered. More than 136 people were adopted. Nobody can simply explain this very clear case of what I would call, with due respect to them, clear ineptitude. Absolute ineptitude, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the entire country is now being ravaged. I am not aware of anyone that is at peace now. The Green Chamber say the president should take responsibility for the mess and question the continued stay in office of the National Security Advisor. What is the job of the National Security Advisor? Do we have a National Security Advisor? All the agencies that have been mentioned, from the Army, Navy, Air Force, Police, DSS, all of these people, all these agencies are accountable to the National Security Advisor. Can't we as a house take more direct action? If our resolution will not work, sir, is it not possible to close this chamber and join us and say we are not resuming here until the Commander-in-Chief perform his duty? I am not directly accusing him, but the book stop at the table of the Commander-in-Chief. If there is success, he will be the first to take the glory. Now there is complete failure, and the, the Commander-in-Chief must take responsibility. We are not safe. But the truth is that let us not lay it at the door or summarize it as being political. Because we know where we were before 2015. I'm not sure we're any better. It is not about the failure of any one individual. All of us have failed. And we must acknowledge that the failure is that of all of us. The lawmakers say drastic action may be required to ensure that security agencies and service chiefs comply with the House resolutions. Mr. Speaker, the truth of the matter is security in Nigeria has become a cash cow business. I am not willing to go without taking my own and he is not willing to go without taking his own. And the other person is not willing to leave until when he got his own turn. It's just like a medical doctor putting professionalism on, the, on one hand aside. You presented a patient. As a patient relative, you said, OK, every month I will give you 100 million naira until when the patient recovers or otherwise. The doctor will make sure that particular patient did not die and he will continue to maintain that he did not recover. I think Nigerians at this moment should be allowed to also take arms. Nigerians must be allowed to take arms in defense of their innocent souls, depend their hard-earned resources and property. Because it's like a monumental failure. If the agencies of security have failed, then Nigerians should not be failed. Nigerians should not be seen as a failure. Let Nigerians organize themselves in the way, in the sense, in the name of civil defense. Civil defense. Let them organize and raise defense for their own souls, innocent souls. Because if the responsibility of the government and the security agencies cannot be carried out democratically, then let's go to jungle. Everyone has cause to defend himself. Nigerians should no longer be running away from attacks. Nigerians should no longer be running away from unnecessary banditry in the face of helpless and, and, and business situation when government and security agencies is like they're failing in their basic responsibility. 
The House of Representatives thereafter suspends legislative activities till April the 5th in honor of the victims of the terror attack. Okay. Right, uh, Tundu. Hmm. Uh, that's gotten to the point where a lawmaker says we should all carry arms to defend ourselves. Yes, it's not the first to make that call. You'll recall that um, retired General T.Y. Danjima also said the same thing. Others have said it as well. And I think I said then that whenever I hear that phrase, take up arms, I remember Hamlet. Well, we're talking before the show about mm. your literary career, weren't we? Mm. Um, Hamlet's soliloquy to take up arms against the sea of trouble and by opposing end them. He was talking, I feel, about suicide. It's some kind of kamikaze mission to expect mm. your average, I don't know, farmer, teacher, journalist, lawyer, to take up arms against terrorists because mm. we're not trained to do that. So this for me, what I'm hearing is complete desperation, a complete lack of faith in those who are trained, those who are equipped by the same National Assembly, because they come to the National Assembly for their budgetary appropriations, do they not? Mm. They get this money and they fail to protect us. So what, what, what the advice now is, we might as well do it ourselves. I don't know about you, but I don't know one end of an AK-47 from the other. I mean, how am I supposed to take up arms? It's a complete failure. Mm. This is what I'm hearing. And that is also why there was one of those um, gentlemen who called for the sacking of the NSA. There have been all kinds of calls. And really, it's an order because this simply cannot continue. We've mm. said it ad nauseum at this point. All we hear, I don't know, the theosaurus in that part must be threadbare at the villa. There's always, there needs to be a new word for every statement about President Buhari condemns this, reprehensible, cowardly, name it. They're going to run out of synonyms at this point. Mm. And people are still dying for no reason. It is completely unacceptable and something has to be done. Yesterday you were speaking with approval, and I don't blame you, about of, um, Governor El Rufai's suggestion to just go there and you have some blitzkrieg on the strategic areas and just destroy these people once and for all. But I think about those whose loved ones uh, you know, have been apprehended by these people. And I kind of balk at that idea. But at this point, desperate times call for desperate measures. I'm glad to see this level of anger from the House of Representatives. It is completely in order. Well, in actual fact, uh, Governor Nasir Rufai that you referred to has uh, gone ahead to reiterate his position. When he visited Giwa local government area yesterday, where last Friday, uh, 50 uh, persons were killed in a total of nine villages. And he told the people of Giwa local government area in all the villages that he visited that, in fact, he remains resolute that the best way to deal with the situation is for the Nigerian government to deploy the super Tucano jets and bomb all those uh, uh, hideouts that are known to the security agencies. He also reassured the people that you will be meeting quickly with the president of Nigeria to restate his position and to tell the president of Nigeria that, look, not enough has been done. And unless the security agencies become proactive rather than reactive, we're likely to be, uh, uh, you know, dealing with this, uh, uh, you know, problem for a much longer time. However, what is instructive here is that you find all of a sudden in the Buhari administration, members of the administration, some of the superstars so proclaimed of the administration, like uh, Ruchimi Amici, like Nasir Rufai, like members of the House of Representatives, criticizing their own government on the basis of the challenge of insecurity. And that is where, you know, the uh, session yesterday at the House of Representatives becomes relevant. The House of Representatives is dominated by members of the All Progressives Congress. The motion that was raised to condemn the uh, Buhari administration's handling of the security situation was raised by a member of the APC. The subsequent dis discussion and all the points made were by members of the uh, uh, All Progressives Congress. Three, in fact, members of the House of Representatives threatened to shut down their assembly and to suspend sittings henceforth until President Muhammad Buhari shows, you know, uh, enough seriousness about tackling the challenge of insecurity in the country. This will be the first time that you will find in the Ninth National Assembly such level of fortrightness. It was a very emotional session, and it was in the course of that that uh, uh, Dogua, the majority leader, made the point that we perhaps have raised the, reached a point 
whereby every Nigerian should be allowed to carry arms. Well, he was speaking out of uh, desperation. He was emotional. He was saying that if the government has failed the people, then let the people help themselves. As you pointed out, Tundo, this is not the first time anyone will make that uh, suggestion. But I don't think it's a good suggestion. You don't, uh, you don't uh, treat uh, cholera with uh, the uh, drugs for, for ringworm. Who do they want to carry arms? They want me to carry arms? I'm a, for heaven's sake, I'm a, I, that's not my job. I'm an intellectual. I'm a serious-minded uh, uh, person who has chosen my own line. Other serious-minded persons have chosen their own line. Let them do their job. There are persons who have elected to protect Nigeria at the risk of death. And we respect them for that. Soldiers, policemen, other security agents. Now what remains is for them to be empowered to do their job. Why lawyers do their own, doctors do their own job, uh, engineers also pursue their own, architects sit down and design beautiful uh, uh, drawings. But to say in Nigeria we should come and start carrying arms. No, I disagree with Honorable Dogua. If, I, if you give me a knife, I don't know how to use it. You rather, it's better you give me a pen. So the kind of, and again, if you go beyond specialization, division of labor, people not uh, uh, doing their own part of the, of the deal. This Nigeria, you go and give people arms and uh, firearms and ammunition, the whole country will be wiped out in less than uh, one week. People are already frustrated. They are kidnapping people. They are ritualists. They don't like each other. Everybody is gossiping. Everybody is climbing over each other. We are living a pressure cooker life. You go and give them those kind of people arms and ammunition to defend themselves, bodies will litter the streets. That would be a prescription for anarchy. And I don't think any serious-minded president of Nigeria will agree uh, to that suggestion. But the big takeaway is to see the House of Representatives expressing concern. I've not seen in the reports any indication that the service chiefs that were summoned eventually showed up yesterday. Maybe that accounted for the uh, emotional uh, you know, position of the House of Representatives yesterday. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that we are all concerned. We are all aggrieved. We want our country to be safe. Particularly when you look at the agony of those families who have not been able to get their loved ones back, who have not, people are even begging for a phone call from the terrorists just to be sure that their persons are alive. That's the crossroads where we have found ourselves at this particular point. However, in another story, we're told that the, uh, the uh, Nigerian Air Force has now been able to get uh, the uh, permission to use the 12 Tucano jets that we got with the promise that uh, they've been directed by the president to ensure very minimal collateral uh, damage. But they've not uh, deployed those Tucano jets in the Northwest yet. Uh, but, you know, there are indications that uh, they've been able to get that approval. We are also told that the Inspector General of Police has deployed, uh, you know, some security personnel to go and protect the engineers who have already commenced the, the repair work on the uh, affected uh, mm. rail lines. Mm. But the problem with all of this is that we only wake up when there is a problem. Mm. It's something called the fire brigade approach. Uh, Mr. Dogowa said people should carry arms. The last time I saw that was about a month ago when 18,000 Ukrainians were giving guns. It was because war was already at their doorstep. I don't support citizens carrying arms, but let's not deceive ourselves. It feels like war is knocking. It is sad. In Ukraine, humanitarian corridor, people are allowed to go in trains, in evacuation, but people in trains moving around are being bombed and killed in our country and kidnapped, and nothing is happening. Things are falling apart. And words are good, but action is even priceless. And I think we're failing Nigerians based on action. We always say we're going to do something about it, but nothing has been done. You are part of a country because you know that the country will defend you. There are constitutional rights to that effect. 
But one too many times, Nigeria is failing its people. History reminds us of what Israel did when some of its citizens were held hostage in another country in Uganda, Entebbe. And the Israelis sent a commando to rescue some people in another country. They didn't care if it was a sovereign country, but they cared more about their citizens. America and Niger Republic. America came to our backyard here in Niger Republic to pull out all the stuff for one citizens. The question I'll ask this morning is, how far will the Nigerian government go for its citizens? You don't need to answer that question, but show me you truly care about the people of Nigeria. And let's hope the pen remains mightier than the sword, Dr. Abati. Or you might have to <laughs> take up our <laughs> I, I hope not. That, I wouldn't know how to that, undo it. That's all on News Headline. We take a short break. When we're... Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. We begin the business segment of the morning show with yesterday's event at the Eco Hotels in Lagos. The Africa Finance Corporation, AFC, a joint venture between public and private investors providing infrastructural solutions on the African continent, has celebrated its 15th year anniversary. This milestone was marked with a private event in Lagos where the AFC and stakeholders gathered to acknowledge the institution's achievements since 2007, having now invested over $10 billion in infrastructure projects across 35 African countries. A RISE correspondent, Leila Johnson Salami, attended the event and had the opportunity to moderate a fireside discussion with the CEO of the AFC and the governor of Lagos State. She sends in this report. In 2007, the Africa Finance Corporation launched as a joint venture between public and private investors with a vision of becoming Africa's leading infrastructure solutions provider. Since then, the institution has developed a footprint across 35 African countries and invested about 10 billion US dollars in infrastructure projects continent wide. The AFC just marked its 15 year anniversary, celebrating this milestone with key stakeholders in Lagos, Nigeria. We are a bridge between international capital markets and Africa. One of our most distinctive comparative advantages is our investment grade rating, and we have protected this rating during some of the world's most turbulent times. We still have it and will continue to focus on improving it. Our strategy is crystal clear. We will continue to grow and diversify our capital sources. What this raising does for us is that it allows us to remain the bridge between Africa and the international capital markets. Today we celebrate our 15th anniversary and we've come a long way. The Africa Finance Corporation is a powerful symbol of Africans taking ownership of our development and future in our own hands. At the event, I had the opportunity to moderate a fireside discussion with the President and CEO of the Africa Finance Corporation, Mr. Samaila Zubairu. You raise the point of Africa's infrastructure deficit, and when we look to the future, currently there are about 1.3 to 1.4 billion of us on the African continent. By the year 2050, I believe that figure is going to be looking more like 2.5 billion, which only increases the challenge when it comes to bridging that gap in infrastructure. How is the AFC planning ahead for this future, a future of such a populous Africa? And in terms of funding, what sort of funding and support support is needed for the AFC to really fulfill its role as a finance development institution? Again, a very good question. Um, so when I joined AFC three and a half years ago, we were about $4.1 billion of balance sheet. And I challenged my team that we would be $10 billion in five years. We need to scale up our size. I was just having a conversation now with the chairman that we need more capital, and he agrees with me. And I've had earlier conversations with some of our investors on the need for them to invest more capital. Some of them agree, some don't. But I think in the end, they will all agree with me that we need more capital, and we need AFC to be a $20, $25 billion institution, and we can achieve it. The governor of Lagos State, Mr. Babajide Samolu, also joined us on stage. 
we need to have you know local you know regulations where investment you know private sector investment can come into public transportation and that is very very important tow roads tow bridges you know these are some of the things that you see everywhere in the world you know and i want to appeal to my people that that's the only way we can do it that's the only way where we can attract that's private sector investment and they can stay with us 20, 25, 30 years, you know, and just wait, you know, um, for, for some of those recoveries to happen. The AFC is on a mission to foster the economic growth and industrial development of African countries while delivering a competitive return on investment to shareholders. Kind of Key stakeholders to, spoke yes, on the contribution of this development financial institution on the African continent over the past 15 years. It's actually quite significant because uh, when AFC got created, uh, it was the first time I think African capital, both private sector and public sector, got together and said, let's create an institution for Africa by African capital. Right? So that's a hugely transformational decision that was taken. And over the 15 years, if you see the investment presence that we've had, which I'm sure you heard from the other speakers, uh, and the sort of projects that we've created out of nothing, it has actually affected a common man. I think AFC is, has been highly transformative. For 15 years, we have almost a 10 billion balance sheet. We have shown that you can you can um, build, develop, and construct African infrastructure and still deliver returns and huge development impact in the African continent. So it is um, about uh, an instrumental uh, AFC for an instrumental infrastructure for the African continent. They have you know, invested quite a significant amount on the continent. Uh, they've even gone into getting bankable transactions with a lot of the other DFIs have not done to date. So I think, you know, they have made an impact and, you know, I'm looking forward to the next 15 years. As the Africa Finance Corporation looks to the future, the belief is that it is time for Africa to sit in its rightful place on the global stage. By encouraging greater investments in Africa by Africa and providing solutions to Africa's infrastructure deficit, the hope is that existing infrastructural gaps will be closed, developing the continent both for present and future generations. Leila Johnson Salami, Arise News, Lagos. Excellent report there by Leila. Moving on, our dependable Rotus Sodiri is here to give us an African business update. Good morning, Rotus. Good morning, Tundu. Good morning, Rufai. Good morning, Doctor. I want to address uh, our fellow Nigerians. We're just having a really tough conversation right now about the situation in the country. I am one of you, and I want the youth to know that I am announcing my candidacy for the 2023 presidential elections with the hashtag Run with Rutus. I know you guys have tough questions for me, so please hit me right here with those questions. Talk so you can go. <laughs> <laughs> April Fools is April Fools. April Fools. April Fools. April Fools. Let's leave that alone. April, happy, April, happy April Fools Day. Let's quickly begin with uh, oil and gas. Uh, OPEC Plus has increased Nigeria's um, quota uh, for the month of uh, May to 1.753 million barrels uh, per day. They increased it from 1.735 million barrels per day for uh, April. As you know, we all know that Nigeria has been struggling to meet uh, her quota. January, we had a, a quota from uh, OPEC of 1.8 million barrels per day. We only did, uh, sorry, 1.6 million barrels per day in January. We only did 1.4 million barrels per day. In February, it was 1.8 million barrels per day was the quota. We only did 1.25. So we, we've talked extensively about the, the struggles uh, that Nigeria has, oil theft and what's been going on, lack of accretion to reserves. Quickly to South Africa. Um, South Africa is reducing the fuel levy uh, by about 40% from April the 6th to May the 31st in order to reduce the pressure of rising fuel prices on the average uh, South African. And this reduction, it's interesting, the levies uh, that are on in South Africa's um, uh, fuel taxes, they make, the levies make up about one third, almost 30% of what you pay for fuel at a uh, fuel station. And of course, that levy goes to fund uh, uh, um, insurance and a whole number of other things. But because, you know, you, Russia, Ukraine, rising oil prices, South African government is doing what it can to um, reduce uh, the impact. Now, now once, speaking of South Africa, I'm not going to jump to Kenya. I had, uh, because I'm about to talk about Kenya's inflation, I had an analyst from Nairobi, Kalia Kiptioni. I asked him about fuel subsidies in Kenya. Here he is mentioning Kenya, who has their own levy. Let's, let's take a listen to that. 
government established a, a fund. So the, there's a tax that is paid that goes towards a subsidy fund that is meant to offset any dramatic or any changes, uh, significant changes in the fuel prices. So that has helped in terms of trying to control the, the price of fuel um, in Kenya, which has helped towards uh, controlling inflation. Um, also, food prices um, went down. Um, we The rainy season were good towards the end of the last uh, last year, and also we are starting to see the short rates coming on right now. So in terms of food and fuel, that's the reason. But going forward, I think we are seeing uh, sharp increases in the price of fuel um, going forward. So I think the inflation is going to go higher in the next um, couple of months. Now, that was just yesterday where he listened to what he said at the end there. Going forward, because of the increase in fuel prices, we'll see inflation go up. Kenya released inflation data just this morning or just late yesterday, it did go up 5.6% year on year uh, in March from 5.1% year on year in February as a result of rising fuel prices. Also, I think Kenya imports about 44% of its wheat from Ukraine and Russia. Wheat prices, uh, food, food non-alcoholic beverages, a number of things went up. So Kenya inflation has actually uh, increased. But they also, as he said at the top there, they also have levies. If I was running for office, I'd put a levy on fuel in Nigeria. Finally, um, film. I think um, with a lot that's been going on, Nigerians want escapism right now. And so I think more... Be oh, no, no, no. George, the Marriott. The Marriott is opening in Masai Mara, in the Masai Mara in Kenya. Um, because of tourism is reopened. Tourism is uh, waking up again in Kenya. So the Marriott Hotel, they're going to set up at Kenya's Masai Mara. Uh, and so I think they're planning to open up later on this year or early next year. So that's the weekend. And then we've got Morbius coming out today if people want escapism uh, due, to, due to what's been going I on. Do. Yeah, so like Morbius is dropping. Leto. And then the Batman has done $130 million Naira. So far, it's number one right now in Nigeria. Nice. So it's after three weeks of release. So uh, yeah, Friday, first of the month. Let's go relax. Yeah. yeah. You got me, Rotus. I have. I did. To I say. got you. You, you thought I was running did. for office. You, you did. did. Right. All right. Because, and I'm sorry, you are at least, and I'm trying to be charitable to some of the aspirants, at the very least, as credible as the aspirants. Well, so I really failed to, really to say, why not? Run with Rotus. I, I mean, like it. Hey, I'm, maybe I, mean, I will do it. I'm, I mean, I'll support you, Rotus. You will? I mean, I'll support you. I got two votes. Doctor, love your votes. And I want you to get. On the Three. Debate, because I know you'll do way better than most of the aspirants. Oh my debate. goodness, Honestly, the pressure. I mean, Dr. Dwight, because I'm, I always cringe. No, in fact, I, I, I believed you. When you you, you did? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, for a moment, I didn't know it was everyone. Uh, and I was going to say to you that, look, you, you made the criteria under Section 131 of the 1999 Constitution. And that's all that is required. That's okay, that's all. To aspire to be president, but you also need money. Yeah, the nomination uh, yeah, form. Yeah. <laughs> that, you, that, that I know you don't. You don't. So, exactly. <laughs> you I don't have that nomination form. Because it's a huge money. volume of money. Right. right. I'm sure you have enough goodwill, you yeah. know, that we uh, uh, you know, provide the necessary support. As for Kenya, yes. yes. We talked about Kenya yesterday when we talked about the inflation rate going down from about 5.4 in January to 5.1 in. Uh, in February, yeah. and now the uh, Kenyan Bureau of uh, National Sta the National Bureau of Statistics has released its own uh, information about inflation rate that it has gone up mm. to 5.6, and this is linked to the crisis between Russia and Ukraine. Kenya imports wheat mm. majorly from you know uh, uh, you know uh, Ukraine, Russia and Russia, Ukraine, yeah, yeah. and then you also have a situation whereby you know the Agriculture Ministry is predicting depressed rains. And that as a result of that, there may be issues with the planting season right. for corn, mm -hmm. which is the main staple in Kenya. So Kenya is expecting food inflation. Now, the question to ask is this. Is the Central Bank of uh, Kenya, which pegged, you know, uh, uh, interest rate at yeah. 70%, is it likely to revise mm. its decision? Mm. Because if, you know, consumer price index continues to rise right. as a result of this, you know, issues that have been identified by the Bureau of National Statistics. It means that perhaps at the next uh, monetary policy committee meeting, uh, Kenya may have to take a different decision. Right. Now, one other issue I wanted to draw attention to, which is not immediately covered there, has to do with the Telecom uh, Association mm -hmm. in Nigeria, yep. the Association of Telecom Operators of Nigeria, licensed telecom Alton. You know, there's a story I, I stumbled upon saying that, look, they are going to shut down operations. First, in Kogi State, because of uh, tax uh, uh, issues. Mm. 
They say they are, that, that some states in Nigeria are unfriendly. And that in Abuja, they have also not been allowed to provide uh, telecom infrastructure by the Federal Capital Territory Development Authority, uh, the FCDA. And that Nigerians should begin to prepare for two things. Increase in tariffs. We are suffering more than enough mm -hmm. with, with the uh, phone tariffs, uh, phone uh, rates that we play. Yeah. And then they say that, uh, you know, they, they will shut down. Mm. If, now, this has security implications. Huge. This has, you know, human relations implications. This could create a very sec uh, serious uh, crisis. I don't know who will engage with Alton and the chairman, Ben Gadebayo, to say that, look, you cannot shut down Nigeria. It's the NCC. Just because the cost of a business is high, and you have states that uh, uh, telecom operators have uh, classified as uh, unfriendly states. Mm -hmm. And please, nobody should increase uh, 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 telecom uh, rates. Harry, yes. No, well said, uh, Doctor. I mean, it has to be said. I want to say something about Kenya, but uh, um, time is fast. Yep. But, so, uh, well, we don't have time you, for problems. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Moving on to more business update. Michael Wilson joins us now from London. Good morning. You have me there, I have to say. Um, if it were me, I would vote for Rosas. Um, no, no, no question what, whatsoever. He, he is absolutely the man for the job. And if you want any votes from overseas, I can organise all that for you. Funds you may have to do yourself. Let's have a look at Asia. Let's have a look at Asia Pacific, first of all. And um, uh, a bit of a fall down, really. We saw that manufacturing index in China coming in slightly lower. Um, sentiment in Japan is down as well. Now, I mean, th there's, there's lots of explanations for this. I'm thinking that plenty of the retreat can be laid at the feet of the COVID lockdowns in China and also, and also soaring energy and commodity prices. Those are clearly playing... Um, their part. Now, Chinese tech stocks in Hong Kong took, have taken a bit of a beating. Alibaba, Baidu, uh, Mei Chuan, um, all down as well. And don't forget, as I was saying yesterday, this property crisis is still going on in, in China. One of them, um, Kaiser Group and Sunak, um, both have had shares suspended in them. Um, I'm going to add to this with a bit of fundamentalism about the markets, if I may. Um, Asia is seeing a wave of buybacks right now, share buybacks. Now, what happens, as I'm sure you know, with share buybacks is the company takes them off the market. There are fewer shares around for the retailers, the retail consumers to buy, the institutional houses to buy and the rest of it. Therefore, the share prices rise. And you tend to do that um, when, when there's little growth. Um, so it, it, it basically... That, that those share buybacks, I think, are a sign of weakness in companies. They're seeing the share prices going down and they, and, they, and, they, and they want to do something mechanical to try to stop that. Therefore, the fewer shares in circulation, the higher the value or at least the price of those shares actually is. Um, overall, then, global deal making is down quite a bit, 23% um, lower. It is in this first four months of, uh, first three months rather of 2022, 23% um, lower than it was um, just before um, the, the pandemic. The biggest one that we've seen, um, that $75 billion Microsoft acquisition of. Um, of Activision Blizzard. Now, the problem, of course, with all those big deals is immediately the regulators start to get interested in terms of what's going on. Now, our new president of uh, to be of Nigeria, Rotus Odiri, and I had a similar problem yesterday. We were scratching our heads about what was happening as far as Russian um, the payments for Russian gas uh, and, and oil exports is. Mario Draghi, who is now the president of Italy, told with a lot of conviction the fact that um, Russia was softening its approach and allowing payments in other things rather than rubles overnight and later in that afternoon. In fact, as Rotus and I were talking during the Global Business Report yesterday, uh, Putin said that Russia will only accept payments in rubles for um, for gas and oil payments into Russia um, from today. Now, they, they did this or they're doing this, I think, because it tends to strengthen the ruble. And sure enough, the ruble has wiped out most of its losses um, that, that it happened that happened before the invasion of Ukraine. Um, it's now... Uh, 
It's now standing at about 81 to the dollar, um, which is roughly where it was on February the 23rd. That is the day um, that is the day before the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, as far as the United States is concerned, yes, we know that uh, President Biden tapped the oil reserves uh, yesterday. Um, you know, the, this, the point, point about that is that it looks as though he's giving away a million dollars a day for a, hundred, a million barrels a day for 180 days, 180 million barrels a day. I mean, he is eroding what is the world's largest strategic supply as a result of all this. And at the, the same time as OPEC actually ignored calls for his help. So it's a pretty tricky route that what they're trying to do, what he's trying to do clearly, he's got one eye on the November midterms coming up later in the year and he's trying to reduce the pain at the pumps. Whether that will happen, we'll see. Um, US recap then, stock futures bounced very, very slightly. Um, not, not a good month for equities as far as the United States is concerned. They posted their worst, all three major indexes that we quote, posted their worst, um, their worst quarter since March 2020. Um, stocks did stage a late kind of quarter comeback very, very slightly. But actually, if you read economic historians now, and there's a couple of them in various uh, magazines, and there's one particular one I was reading in the F in the Financial Times yesterday, they're thinking that this freezing and these sanctions may well cause little currency blocks to prop up or to, to crop up around the world, which will weaken the idea of a dollar as an international. Uh, payment currency. I mean, that's open to debate, not happening right now, but that's the fear that economics historians are actually happening. happening. Right now in this country, the cost of living crisis is really beginning to bite. Um, uh, fuel costs rising, energy costs rising. Um, we know that national insurance is kicking in as well. So we're the beginning of April and it's all looking fairly grim as far as the UK is concerned. And a lot of the Labour Party and a lot of Charities are warning about this thing called absolute poverty. Now, okay. as, as again, we've had discussions about this previously on the programme. Um, that that tends to vary. It's, it's all poverty is 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 relative, okay. but it's still. This is facing people in this country. Oil is softer in Asia. And as we go into the weekend, the annoying thing for those who are gold bulls at the moment is that gold is moving sideways. And normally, when there's lots of volatility, people tend to go into it. They're not going into it now. I don't know the reason why, but that's how we're ending the week. That's the global view. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael.